Welcome to this tutorial on the ionic basis of the resting membrane potential. This tutorial will relate to one of the core concepts in the field of neuroscience. It's core concept number two, as uh, defined by the Society for Neuroscience. I would encourage you to visit brainfacts.org and navigate to core concepts to learn more about um, what these concepts are all about. Um, but for our purposes, it's useful to just highlight how this tutorial right now relates to the broader field of neuroscience. And it does so because we're going to begin a discussion about how neurons communicate using electrical and chemical signals. And the concept for today's tutorial, the resting membrane potential, really sets the stage for all manner of communication among neurons. So we do have some learning objectives for you today. I want you to be able to describe the concept of electrochemical equilibrium and relate this concept to the resting membrane potential of neurons. I want you to be able to explain why the permeability of the neuronal plasma membrane at rest to potassium ions and the concentration gradient of this ion across the neuronal plasma membrane together account for the resting membrane potential of neurons. I want you to do so in a rather formal way I want to introduce to you something called the Nernst equation and challenge you to use the Nernst equation to predict the resting membrane potential of neurons given knowledge of the concentration gradients of permeant ions. Okay, well, let's begin. Okay, well, to begin with, let's consider two important mechanisms that support all manner of electrical signaling that we find in nerve cells. These mechanisms are supported by two very different kinds of proteins that we find in the membranes of neurons. One type of protein is an ion pump or an ion transporter. It's illustrated on the left hand side of this slide. What these pumps and transporters do is translocate ions from a region of low concentration to a region of high concentration which is why I've drawn this large arrow over to the left indicating an active mechanism that's pumping ions upstream, if you will, that is against a concentration gradient. And in this particular example, as this molecule binds an ion from a region of low concentration inside the cell and delivers it across the membrane to a region of high concentration, there's the consumption of energy. And so for that reason, we consider this to be an example of active transport. Now, on the right side of this slide, we have an illustration of the second kind of mechanism that's critical for neural signaling. Once we establish concentration gradients of ions, we can discharge those gradients to create electrical signals but that requires some means of regulating the permeability of the neuronal plasma membrane to a permeant ion. And this is accomplished via the function of ion channels. So these are integral membrane proteins that create an aqueous pore for the passage of an ion from a region of high concentration to low concentration. So what we see on the right is a means for allowing for ions to diffuse down their chemical concentration gradients. So I want you to see how these two mechanisms work hand in hand. Pumps establish the concentration gradients that provide the driving force for the diffusion of ions across the neuronal plasma membrane. Now, in order to understand how all this works and the significance of ions passing across a permeable membrane, let's begin by considering a simple model system. So in this case, what we have is a uh, semi-permeable membrane that divides some kind of container into two kinds of compartments. And that membrane has ion channels in it that allow for the passage of potassium ions. So what we've done here is we've simply filled a container with a one millimolar potassium chloride solution with this membrane running right down the middle. So under these conditions, potassium ions are free to pass from one side of the membrane to the other, 
and there is no net flux of potassium. That is, just as much potassium goes to one side as back across the membrane to the other. And as a result, if we were to insert um, wires into either side of this chamber and then record a, an electrical potential, we'd see that there is essentially no potential difference. That is, the voltmeter would record a potential of zero. Now imagine what would happen if we replaced the solution on one side of this chamber, let's say on the left side of the chamber, with a 10 millimolar potassium chloride solution, such that on the left side we have 10 times the concentration of potassium as on the right. So if we were to do this kind of an experiment, what we would find is that very quickly we would go from the initial condition to some kind of a equilibrium. And that equilibrium will be established as potassium ions diffuse down their concentration gradient from the left side of the chamber to the right. Now, what will happen? Well, potassium ions will move and potassium ions carry a positive charge. So as potassium ions diffuse down their concentration gradient, what we will discover is the accumulation of positive charge on the right side of this membrane. That is, the right side of this membrane will become slightly positive relative to the left. And in a complementary fashion, we'll have the accumulation of negative charge on the left-hand side of this membrane in the compartment of higher potassium chloride solution. So the positive charge is conveyed via potassium ion. The negative charge is reflected in the dissociation of chloride ion from the potassium chloride compound. Now, of course, these movements of ions across this membrane happen uh, in just an instant. So this equilibrium is established very quickly. And what will happen at equilibrium is that an electrical potential will become established across that membrane with a predictable magnitude of that potential. In fact, in this case, the potential has a magnitude of 58 millivolts with compartment uh, number one on the left hand side being 58 millivolts negative to compartment number two on the right hand side. So when we establish electrochemical equilibrium we have achieved a state at which the flux of potassium ions from one side of this membrane to the other side is exactly balanced by an opposing membrane potential. This is in fact the definition of equilibrium. So let me repeat myself and try to make this even more clear to you. So as potassium diffuses down its concentration gradient, an electrical force builds up that is exactly equal and opposite to the strength of the chemical gradient. So in conceptual terms, we have a concentration gradient because we chose to put on one side of this membrane a tenfold more concentrated solution of potassium chloride. But once that was done, potassium diffused across this semi-permeable membrane to the point where an electrical gradient was established that's equal and opposite in magnitude. And that gradient, as measured by our voltmeter, is precisely minus 58 millivolts. And I want you to understand intuitively, not so much quantitatively, but intuitively, uh, what that magnitude of an electrical potential actually is and how to get a feel for understanding changes in that potential across a neuronal membrane if you know something about the permeant ions and their concentrations. But before we get to a more formal and quantitative approach to understanding this membrane potential at equilibrium, let's just emphasize again the key factors that are responsible for setting up this potential in the first place. The key factors that are needed for the generation of this bioelectrical potential are a mechanism for establishing the concentration gradient. And that happens via the activity of ion pumps and ion transporters, as illustrated on the left-hand side of the figure. Now, we establish the concentration gradient 
but there will be no membrane potential unless there's the passage of ions through some permeability channel. And that's where the integral membrane protein that creates an ion channel comes in. So the ion channel allows for this membrane to be selectively permeable to a particular ionic species. Now, for real neurons in real nervous systems, both of these mechanisms are in operation with respect to potassium ions. In fact, at first approximation, the movement of potassium ions across a semipermeable membrane is sufficient to explain the resting membrane potential of neurons. Now, I'd like to make just a couple of other points as we um, pass through this discussion of resting membrane potential. One is that we don't actually have to move a large number of potassium ions in order to establish this potential. So it happens very quickly, and it happens with the movement of a relatively small number of ions. And as a consequence, we really aren't fundamentally changing the concentration of solutions on one side of that membrane or another. So we still have a 10 millimolar solution on one side, a 1 millimolar solution on the other in our model system. Another consequence is that because we have chloride ion on either side of our membrane, and that chloride ion has no channel, in this model system anyway, that will allow it to permeate, we can establish overall electrical neutrality. Uh, that is to say that while there is a separation of charge on either side of the membrane, the solutions themselves on one side or the other are electrically neutral. The positive charge is balanced out by negative charge. And then lastly, I would say that the separation of charge is really only limited to this membrane. Sometimes I like to think about um, being inside of a cell and maybe the walls of this room being uh, the plasma membrane surrounding this wall and if there's overall electrical neutrality I can move through this space and not uh, feel an electrical charge but if I were to touch the wall such as what I might do. If I were to touch the wall, maybe I would get a bit of a shock because the separation of charge is limited just to that space. Well, I'm not sure how well that worked for you on camera, but um, I think you get the idea. So the separation of charge is limited just to the perimeter of that cell, that is, to either side of the neuronal plasma membrane. Now, from time to time, I'm going to point you to what I think are some pretty helpful animations that are at the website that supports the textbook that I'm recommending that you read as we work through these tutorials in medical neuroscience. So if you follow the link in the handout that I gave you, uh, or if you navigate to the website uh, from Sinauer Associates uh, that supports uh, Neuroscience 5th Edition, you'll get to a series of animations and I would direct your attention to the animation in Chapter 2 called The Resting Membrane Potential. So if you simply click the link in the PDF file, that should take you right there. Otherwise, you can navigate there on your own. And hopefully, you'll find this animation a useful summary of what we've discussed so far, and even more.